Well, thanks very much for giving me the opportunity to speak, to introduce Jay Weatherall, our uh, key uh, speaker this evening. I want to start by acknowledging that, I meet, that we meet on the traditional lands of the Noongar people and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. There's no question that the transition in the energy system is much more dramatic and much more rapid than anybody expected. Um, when I first became Shadow Minister for Energy in 2012, the major topic of conversation was how do you cope with peak energy demand? Now today, we don't, that's almost not part of the conversation. Now the conversation is focused on how do you uh, maintain stability in the grid while introducing higher and higher quantities of uh, carbon-free renewable energy. And there's nowhere in Australia that's had to face the challenge that that uh, new uh, discussion then in South Australia. And there's nobody who has had a stronger role in uh, trying to ready their state, their jurisdiction for that challenge than Jay Weatherall, the former Premier of South Australia. I'm very pleased that he's joining SEN here to today. There's no question that the um, political consequences of uh, problems in the electricity system uh, are keenly felt by everybody in government. And again, I'm sure Jay has some comments to make in that, that regard. I remember when I was State Secretary of the Labor Party assisting uh, Eric Ripper in uh, managing the disaggregation of the old Western Power through the Labor Party before he had to do that through the Parliament. Uh, we, we would frequently talk on the telephone about what negotiations were going on, what discussions had had been with unions or other interest groups. And at the end of every conversation, I used to say to Eric, well, don't forget, Eric, if the lights go out, it's your fault. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'm pleased to now have that responsibility. Um, there, this is a challenge. Uh, it's interesting, you know, the 1.3 billion people in the world today don't have access to electricity. Uh, that is an extraordinary number. And interestingly, the, the, world, the, the, the world Bank, the IMF, these other uh, global organisations have a plan to provide electricity to all those people. And their plan is to use traditional methods of centralised generation, large scale transmission and then a distribution network. Of course, for the exact same amount of money now, they could start at the village level, at the community level and build up and provide electricity much faster to that 1.3 billion people. That's because there's been a revolution in, in, in the, uh, uh, the energy system. And that revolution is here in Western Australia but South Australia was the place in, in this country where it happened first. And Jay Weatherall was uh, keenly part of that, uh, that uh, transformation. And so I'm really pleased that he's here to talk about the lessons that uh, South Australia provide uh, for all of us in this country uh, in managing this uh, important change. Now, in finally, in uh, asking uh, uh, Jay to come forward, I want to make the point that uh, the Commonwealth Government talks a lot about the energy system at the moment, but what they don't tell you, of course, is that they don't actually have any uh, responsibility for the system. You know, the system is run by the states. And here in Western Australia, of course, we're not even part of the national electricity system because, you know, physically we're not connected. So that does bring enormous challenges. And what I would say about the national electricity market and the issues that ar arose in South Australia was that there was a, a big gap between the economics and the financial debate regarding the national electricity system, which didn't match the physics of the national electricity system. And that's one of the challenges that we're confronting here in, in Western Australia. And we want to make sure that uh, we can uh, transition to make sure that the physics of the system are matched by the finances of the system. And the, the last thing I'll say is that uh, in, in here, in Western Australia, in doing those planning, we're advantaged because we own virtually every aspect of the system. We don't own, own all the generators, but we own the, the poles and wire, the transmission and the distribution business. And that gives us an enormous advantage. In South Australia, Jay had to cope with the dynamic changes to the system without owning the assets because they'd been uh, privatised by a previous Liberal government. So, uh, you know, it, it's a remarkable achievement uh, the South Australian electricity system, despite the fact that sometime in the media it's presented as, as an example of, of what not to do, it's actually an example of what we need to do. We need to plan for this transition because the transition is happening 
regardless of policy and regardless, regardless of politicians. So I'm really pleased that SEN, I'm pleased to be back at SEN in the energy role. I was pleased to be here regularly in opposition and I'm so pleased that uh, you've uh, invited uh, a distinguished Australian in Jay Weatherall to make some remarks. So please, Jay, we'll look forward to listening to your comments. <laughs> Thank you, Minister, for that kind introduction, and uh, to Ian and, and all those responsible for bringing me, me here, Joyce. And uh, of course, um, this organisation for providing me with the opportunity to speak a little of, of South Australia's experience. I, I should uh, give you a disclosure first. I'm not an energy expert. I happen to have uh, led a government that had to grapple with uh, the question of energy security and supply in a pretty spectacular fashion, which I'll uh, begin by mentioning in a moment. Uh, nor am I really an expert in the Western Australian segment, uh, if you like, of uh, uh, the energy market in, in this nation. Uh, but what I hope to do is to tell you about the South Australian journey, the South Australian experience, try and draw out some of the key learnings that I think emerge for us as a, a part of that and try and point up what I uh, regard as, as possible future directions for you. But I, I really do want to, to give you a very big caveat that these may or may not be applicable to your circumstances. And I'm sure uh, the Minister um, will be well acquainted with that. Of course, one of the first things I was going to suggest was to put in place an integrated uh, system plan which covered both distribution, generation and demand management. And that's precisely uh, what your minister has announced uh, just uh, a few weeks ago. Um, so uh, you can tick that one off, uh, but there are uh, hopefully there'll be some other things which uh, might make sense to you. Well, um, at 3.50 p.m. on the 28th of September uh, 2016, the lights flickered in Parliament House. I didn't think anything of it uh, until a rather white-faced energy minister came bursting into my office and said, we're system black. And uh, I said, what's system black? He said, there are no lights on in the whole of the state. So I looked outside and true enough, there were no <laughs> lights on. We have a generator in Parliament House and so therefore uh, we were quarantined from the, the impact uh, of this. At uh, this, this moment uh, caused the energy debate, as you'd imagine, to explode in South Australia. It had been a long fuse that really had been lit a long time ago, really a, a decade of inaction in relation to putting a price on carbon, um, a, a series of um, essentially uh, decisions, including the privatisation of our power and generation assets, uh, the inability or unwillingness of the private sector to continue to invest uh, in generation assets such that um, uh, most of our generation had uh, either closed or needed to be renovated and there was no new investment. And then the advent of uh, the introduction of a mandatory renewable energy target which was constructed at a time uh, which it was based on the, the premise that there would be growing demand in the, uh, in the national demand for electricity. Uh, but that did not prove to be the case. So the way in which the mandatory renewable energy target was constructed had the effect of um, encouraging a lot of renewable energy into the system, but in circumstances where it was competing with existing thermal demand, effectively stripping out the business case for existing thermal generators. First, it reduced the actual amount of uh, demand in the system because it could supply it at zero marginal cost, so it was always winning the bidding war, but it also had the effect of lowering the pool price. So it did two things. It reduced quantity and it reduced price, which destroyed the business model of a range of uh, thermal generators. Uh, and uh, in South Australia had a particularly low um, demand because we had the, the shutting of a range of our industrial concerns as as industry um, responded to essentially the global financial crisis. So all of those things 
uh, were, were happening at the same time. We had the unintended negative consequence of bringing renewables into the system, of stripping out in a disorderly way the business case for thermal generation. Uh, then also at the same time a stalemate on a national basis for the creation of a price on, price on carbon, which would have given the right price signal to thermal generators to invest so that they would have been there to support the influx of renewable energy. And the simple, the simple dynamics which everybody was calling for for a decade but which never happened was to put a sufficient price on carbon such that the price of coal would be more expensive than the price of gas and you would get fuel switching which would then um, essentially animate the business case for gas fired generation. It would be built and it would supply essentially the, the gaps in the, in the market. Remembering of course now with the influx of renewables you had a very, you had a market which looked, was shot through with holes. It would have at different points in the day there would be a need for different generation uh, depending on wind and solar. There would be this variable requirement which is ill suited to coal fired generation. So coal fired generation has a lot of trouble switching on and off. Uh, whereas fast start gas generation has the capacity to fill those gaps. So none of that was available. So we were heading towards uh, essentially a, a, a bit of a, um, a, bit of a, um, a showdown. The way in which that showdown was manifested was, was not in actually a reliability question in the market, although there were warnings about reliability issues. It was, it was really initially manifested by a dramatic increase in the electricity price. Why? Uh, well, because you had, uh, the in as, as all of these thermal generators fell out of the system, you had a market that essentially on the South Australian side of the, the region just had few generators. And so a small number of generators were writing the contracts, feeling their market power. They just wrote whatever prices that they wanted to write. And that, of course, led to a dramatic escalation in prices. So we had the, we had uh, a really um, um, poisonous political environment that was developing. Um, a, a lobby that was um, fueled by the, the, the vested interest of the fossil fuel industry, which was promoting uh, fossil fuels, attacking renewable energies, a steep increase in power prices, and then bang, a statewide blackout, probably the worst possible place in the world to be for a politician. <laughs> uh, uh, and it wasn't too pleasant for... Well, in fact, the, the interesting thing about the blackout was it was actually responded to pretty quickly. Most people had their power on within two or three hours. Uh, and there was a particular circumstance on the West Coast which meant they had to wait a few days, but that was a distribution question more than a generation question. But really most people started up again pretty quickly. But what it led to was a fascinating series of political events which um, really has constructed you know, where we are politically in this nation in relation to this energy to renewable energy debate. The first thing that happened within 35 minutes, Nick Xenophon, a senator in South Australia, found his way into an ABC studio uh, in Canberra to uh, <coughs> first tell everyone that people would die in hospitals, that the Royal Adelaide Hospital power was down, which was not true. Uh, and you had uh, Chris Yulman, who was otherwise regarded as a very respected voice of the national broadcaster, saying uh, that we had 40% of our, our uh, generation was renewables, uh, that it was dominated by wind, and the wind was blowing so strong that it meant that uh, we had the statewide blackout. All complete nonsense. Uh, and, but this was, being, this was being broadcast during a national emergency. Inaccurate information transmitted uh, to those people that were able to hear it, and of course on radio, uh, to South Australians who were in the midst of this crisis. One of the things that we're taught about emergency management is that it's important to have trusted sources of information, that they're to be accurate uh, and they're to be, and, and generally they should come through one source. In this case, it should have been the Premier of South Australia. Uh, and I did, what I did was Im immediately convened a, a cabinet meeting in Parliament House. I called the Prime Minister immediately, 
told him what was going on. Uh, and uh, never at any stage through that crisis, up until I'm still waiting for the telephone call back uh, from Malcolm Turnbull. <laughs> so the, so the, this was the, this was the, the aftermath, if you like. It was a heightened political environment. The next day, we saw Barnaby Joyce out on national radio attacking South Australia's leadership in renewable energy. We had, once again, the Prime Minister, Malcolm Turnbull, attacking South Australia's leadership in renewable energy. Leave aside the fact that a few months before, he was standing up in the uh, federal election campaign in 2016, praising South Australia's leadership in relation to renewable energy and taking credit for it uh, through his renewable energy target. But this was the this was the political. It was an opportunistic political environment into which people were stepping. Then we had a series of other circumstances. Well, the next the very next day, and I the document I had in front of me was the same document that was in front of the prime minister, uh, which was the root cause was the storm. Uh, three very rare supercell uh, cyclones, which uh, had wind speeds of over 250 kilometres an hour, unheard of in South Australia ripped the spine out of our transmission network and it led to a series of faults which jolted the system and, uh, and caused a range of generation to be knocked out. The Prime Minister had that in front of him, uh, as did I, yet he still chose to, to pursue that path. Then a series of other things. We had a series of, it was a very bad weather season. We had a, a storm event on the 28th of December uh, which knocked out um, about 350,000 homes, just completely, it was just essentially a storm knocking down local distribution. But nevertheless, it was used to play into the idea of an unstable electricity grid, which was the cause caused by renewables. So neither the statewide blackout nor this event had anything to do with the traditional criticism of renewables, which is their intermittency. Then, then, of course, there was another, another event, another strange event that occurred uh, due to the interconnector being uh, knocked out. It happened in the middle of the night, so not many people noticed except BHP. But it then led to a fresh round of recriminations. Uh, and, uh, and then, of course, the event that really was the, was really the point of inflection, and, and that was on uh, the 8th of February, we were in the midst of a heat wave, a massive heat wave which was rolling across the state, uh, we became concerned, because we don't run the national electricity market, that uh, we were going to, there was going to be a, a reserve shortfall. We communicated that to the Australian energy market operator, and the Australian energy market operator, uh, who was meeting in Adelaide on that day, ironically, as a board, um, said that they didn't, you know, didn't think that there was going to be any difficulty. Pelican Point, which was a gas-fired generator, uh, which had been mothballed for the reasons I mentioned earlier about questions of uh, viability, were considering re-entering the market because they also owned Hazelwood that they were about to close for the same reasons that I mentioned earlier. Uh, and they wondered whether they were going to be called upon. So they contacted the Australian Energy Market Operator and said, look, you're going to have to give us a few hours notice if you want us to switch on. Anyway, it got to about 4 p.m. and Australian energy market operator realised that they were short. They called Pelican Point. Pelican Point said, sorry, we can't be ready in time. Uh, so they then gave an instruction to the distribution network to black out 30,000 homes in South Australia. The network operator accidentally blacked out 90,000 homes uh, and almost sent the grid cascading because of the uh, uh, frequency change at the other end. Eventually that was remedied um, and ultimately this was a catastrophe um, because on top of everything else it gave fuel to our opponents that, that essentially we had an unstable grid even though this had absolutely nothing to do with renewables and everything to do with an uh, Australian energy market operator that couldn't get themselves organised to actually manage the grid. And it was at that point that I realised we were on our own that this market, the national market and the national operator, was thinking about South Australia as merely a sub-region in what was a very, very large machine, stretching from Bunbury all the way down to, to, to uh, Sejuna, I presume. 
a very, very large operation. So if there's a little bit of problems, you know, 30,000 homes uh, in, in South Australia, no biggie. Well, for us, it was a massive reputational issue. And of course, the, the whole national political apparatus collapsed down on top of us. Uh, you might recall the very next day, the 9th of February, uh, the current Prime Minister walked into Parliament with a lump of coal. <laughs> so they were closing in for the kill. This was the coup de grace that was going to be delivered on the South Australian Government because of its leadership in renewable energy. Then something happened. The very next day, uh, New South Wales, because by this time the heat wave had moved across the nation, as they tend to do, the, the uh, New South Wales system had a, an identical load shedding event to the South Australian system. It wasn't as obvious in terms of households because uh, they were able to shut down the Tomago smelter and just take out 12% of their load like that. But it was an unplanned shutdown, L LRR3, a, an unplanned load shedding event, caused essentially, and this was, this was coal rich New South Wales. <laughs> so all of a sudden, what seemed to be a South Australian disease became a problem with the national electricity market. And you could hear the asses clunking all over Canberra <laughs> as they all finally realised that they were now the proud owners of a national electricity market in crisis. So thinking that they were going to do a quick knife job on me, uh, it ended up spraying back on them. And really that's the story of everything that's occurred since. Now then it got worse because price rises started to occur across the nation. Hazelwood, a bunch of other, um, you've seen all the, you know, the bedwetting over the closure of of all of these other plants around uh, the, the nation as they've suddenly realised that they have now made reliability and price a national policy imperative without, as the Minister said, having any constitutional authority to do it. And that's when Malcolm Turnbull found himself in the most dangerous place on the planet, stuck between some Labor governments that wanted him to take proper action on climate change and a group of right-wingers in, uh, in his caucus who were trying to strangle him. So we wouldn't take our, our foot off his throat until he delivered a proper uh, response to climate change. And of course the right-wingers were, ha were happy enough to have him captured there in the middle of this debate until they drained away all of his, his political capital. And you know, it's one of the most brutal things I've seen in politics. He first, First he says clean energy, first he says emissions intensity scheme, can't do that. Sounds like a price on carbon. Then the clean energy target, sounds too clean, must be bad for coal. <laughs> then then, then he, they, they come up with the neg. And then they say, no, you can't do that, that looks a little bit too much like a price on carbon. And then, and then finally, um, he, he says, uh, he, he, he even drops the, the neg. And what do they say about him? How can you believe a bloke that doesn't have the courage of his convictions? <laughs> so, so he thought he was appeasing them to try and improve the quality of the policy. They were trying to kill him, to actually take, rob him of his political credibility. All the time, we now know, by virtue of the confession that was made by Glencore, that they were pumping tens of millions of dollars into a PR campaign that was that was basically directed at influencing social media and other media and running politicians to actually run these lines. We know, of course, about coal, uh, the coal industry fund, which is meant to be about clean coal, that was all diverted into PR. So we had this massive apparatus that was being brought down on us. Um, now, what do we do? Well, um, we... One thing about a crisis is that it gives you political permission to act. We couldn't have had a bigger crisis. Everyone knew what the, the why was. Why are we doing this? So I stood up on the 9th of February and said that we have a broken national electricity market and South Australia is going to take charge of our energy future. And what happened over the next six weeks was probably the most exciting and rewarding and, uh, I think, powerful piece of public policy I've ever been involved in. It was essentially, it was almost like a crowdsourcing uh, campaign to actually populate 
that basic idea with meaning. Uh, and once we had, once we'd established the why, which is a broken national electricity market, uh, and we incorporated the strategic objective that's take control of our energy future, we then had we were we were just um, absolutely inundated with unsolicited bids from, and, and the most spectacular one, of course, was Elon Musk's um, big battery. As it happened, we'd already decided to put a big battery in the system, and so Elon almost upend the whole. Apple cart with his offer, but nevertheless, it was an example of the style of unsolicited bids that we were receiving. And we were evaluating in real time. Cabinet met two or three times a week for six weeks. We had expert advisors in the cabinet sitting alongside us working through this. Uh, and we crafted a six point energy plan. Uh, the first was to give the, the State Minister powers to actually intervene something you don't have to be troubled with because you run your own system. Uh, the second thing that we did was to incorporate, to have our own state-owned generator with reserve capacity to intervene if the market failed. The third thing we did was to uh, create uh, a renewable technology fund and the first allocation out of that fund, a grant and loan scheme to incentivise uh, the investment in new forms of energy that could meet that objective. The first cab off the rank was, of course, the 100 megawatt um, big battery. And, and just, a, just a word about the big battery. Um, the, the, the skeptics, and these are, these are, so the chairperson of AEMO said that the months before, only a few months before this, said that it's unlikely that grid level batteries have made any meaningful contribution to the stability of the national electricity grid. I think the Minerals Council said it would take two or three years to build. Uh, we launched our energy plan on the 13th of March. We awarded it to Tesla on the 7th of July and it was up and running on the 1st of December. In its first full year of operation, uh, it saved the market in terms of frequency control services uh, $45 million. It's cost us uh, $4.5 million each year. So 4.6 million dollars each year, so 46 million over 10 years. So it's paid for itself in, in 12 months, leaving aside what it's done to stabilise not just our grid, but the whole of the national electricity market. The, the second, the, 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 sorry, the, the, the next element of the plan was to use our state procurement. So we put all of that, the energy that the government buys for police stations and uh, schools and all the rest of it, out to the market with two requirements. One, that it should be dispatchable so that we had new forms of generation to bring new competitors into the market, both to reduce price but also to stabilise the renewables, which by this stage were, were moving towards 50%. Uh, and uh, we also required that, uh, if possible, it could be renewable. And, we, and the, uh, the winning bid uh, was, in fact, a solar thermal plant which was based in Port Augusta. The reason I mention that is that, and this was won fair and square through a competitive tender process, so it beat out coal, gas, the whole, any other competitor. Um, and it, it had the, um, the, the other very important benefit, which is something that I think has got great relevance to you, and that is that Port Augusta is a former coal uh, generation town. Uh, and just up the road is Lee Creek, a former coal mine. And it, in, in, in what I understand is a similar model that was used in West Australia, it was used to develop the state. It was used as a form of industry development. But that technology in that town was obviously very important for the jobs and prosperity and a sense of identity for that town. And what happened really uh, as much as 20 years ago now is that the, a local mayor in that town began a campaign against the coal-fired power station, not for renewable energy purposes, because of uh, essentially uh, air pollution. So the community was already sensitised to the, the risks associated with the, the coal-fired power station. But at the same time, she also, in a very far-sighted way, promoted renewable energy as a potential solution to, to allow people that were working in those jobs 
to be able to transition into other jobs. And this, this um, attitude, this mood of mind that, that existed in this community was well established before these events occurred. So when, when it appeared that the power station was on its last legs and indeed closed a few, um, about 12 months or so before the, the statewide blackout, there was already a view that the community was, was in dialogue with a range of renewable energy operators, including the one that ultimately was successful, Solar Reserve. Uh, and I think that the, the idea of the community uh, owning and getting in behind other forms of technologies to generate power is a very powerful model. One of the obvious practical reasons why that is possible is that all the generation, all the distribution and transmission assets head into those locations. So this, th this is a potential pattern uh, and a, a potential opportunity. The other couple of elements of the, the plan uh, was the encouragement of um, the, both the search for uh, and the exploitation of gas reserves in South Australia. We did that in two ways, to give royalties to property owners and also to uh, provide uh, grants for a plan for accelerated exploration. And in a sense it was like a reverse reservation policy. So gas that was found through that process could be reserved for the purposes of power generation. Uh, and of course I know you have a, one of the advantages you have here is, is relatively uh, cheap uh, gas through, by virtue of a, a reservation policy that's been the policy of, of uh, a previous state Labor government. That puts you in a particularly uh, strong position because gas, at least at this stage, appears to be an important transitional fuel as we decarbonise our electricity system. And then f the final element was some species of a carbon price but which was taken over by national events. So that's the nature, if you like, of the South Australian story. There are many other elements to it. The Renewable Technology Fund also has funded uh, another very interesting project. It's a virtual power plant, 250,000 megawatt power plant, using the rooftops of 50,000 housing trust houses. So the state owned housing, so we were able to pledge those rooftops, batteries, solar panels linked up. Uh, once again, Tesla won that competitive process to um, essentially send that power into the grid. And this, of course, is highly relevant to grids that are becoming now less stable uh, because of the influx of, of renewable energy uh, through solar panels. So what can we learn? Um, well, the first thing is the power of vested interests, uh, and, uh, but also communities who have, have, who have legitimate interests in, in their uh, uh, circumstances to uh, protect but also the, the countervailing community support for renewables. Through all of this, uh, through all of the misinformation, the community retained extraordinarily strong levels of support for renewable energy. Um, and it was, and we were being smashed every day, because we've only got one paper and it's owned by one bloke. Uh, and <laughs> we, we were getting smashed every day. And, uh, but despite that, people said, no, we believe this is the future. And it wasn't, it, wasn't it wasn't just people that were worried about the environment, although that was a substantial number of them. It was also people that believed that renewable energy was you know, the natural next step in, the, in, in this big, long process of technological change. So even people, people could see that, I mean, in, in a sense, uh, fossil fuels, which have been so important for our prosperity, for the world's prosperity, they were by definition going to be depleted. In, 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 it necessarily is the case we're going to have to move to some form of technology, leaving aside the importance of what it's doing to the planet. And so there's a group of people that are supportive of that. There are some people that are so supportive of renewable energy, they say we don't care whether it caused the blackout, we just think this is the price of technological change. So there was extraordinarily strong support across a range of different cohorts. Uh, but the one area of resistance were particularly uh, men of a certain age who were worried about the destruction of jobs of a certain type and couldn't see a future for themselves or their families. 
and this is a it's an important lesson because if you're going to embark on this journey you also have to ensure uh, that the, the concerns and the needs of people and communities are addressed uh, otherwise this will be a substantial and important uh, lobby group that will be used to advance uh, the advanced against uh, further pushes into renewable energy and rightly so I mean we cannot leave people behind the other experience I suppose was the inexperienced and inadequate governance and regulatory mechanisms which are simply not equipped to manage uh, challenges of this sort uh, and nor are they really equipped to facilitate innovation um, you know, the traditional operators, there'll be big vested interests who say, well, thermal generation, it's simple, it's straightforward, base load um, just gives you none of the issues with frequency, uh, it doesn't give you any issues uh, with supply, you just want to chug this stuff out, uh, and it's relatively low cost. And that has been true of the past, but it simply isn't true now. I mean, the, the market is simply going to alter by virtue of the decisions that are being made by individuals. I mean, people are voting with their feet. They're putting rooftop solar on. The market is altering. It's already being hollowed out by all this solar power. The, the demand profile is completely different than it was in the day when these coal-fired stations were being built. Because there is a natural demand for people to actually respond to the exigencies of climate change. And you can't just assume that away. It's, and, and if the federal government won't act, states will. It's worth reminding us that who actually put in place the first carbon pollution reduction scheme, it came out of a report that was commissioned of Ross Garneau. Professor Ross Garneau wrote the report back in 2006. All state Labor governments, as they were at that stage, commissioned this report. Then Rudd got in and he uh, essentially uh, took it over and it became a federal program and then led to federal legislation. But so as the, st as the Commonwealth retreats from action on climate change, <coughs> states will step in. Why will they step in? Because the citizens will demand that they step in. Now this is, this is very unfortunate for a coherent policy because you'll get a series of states that will race off and, and, and try and manage this themselves. I mean, ideally there'd be a coherent national and state framework. But you can't assume away the demands of citizens to take action on climate change. And you only need to look at what's happened in the last month to realise this is accelerating. It's not decelerating. Just in the last month we've seen extraordinary scenes. We've seen the Deputy Governor of the Reserve Bank saying climate risk represents a massive corporate issue. APRA saying if this isn't taken into account it will be the subject of, of action. You've seen that extraordinary international movement of students marching in the street all around the world demanding that adults take action on climate change. You've seen Glencore um, cap their coal exports. You've seen them put their hand up saying we were very naughty in funding a pro-coal campaign. I mean the list goes on and on and every day you pick up the paper. I mean today I was, I was reading the paper and we now got this big long uh, discussion from Paul Kelly, not, not a well-known socialist, <laughs> who, who, is, who is discussing the idea of environmental, social and governance risks. And that, that it is now, it, it is overwhelmingly on the agenda, driven by industry super funds, and they simply will insist that this is taken into account. You've got the, uh, you've got the climate group of investors, uh, a, a body of investors that are now pricing in, in carbon risk by virtue of the work that was done by Bloomberg to actually identify and allow people to, to, to incorporate that into their investing decisions. This is, this is inexorable and unstoppable. Um, but what we don't have are the regulatory and governance mechanisms which are equipped to manage this. One example is a big battery would have made sense at any time if there was a market for it. The, the way in which we settle the uh, pricing signals in relation to uh, all markets, presumably yours as well, is that the pricing intervals are not apt to allow the battery, which has done all its work inside a five minute period, to actually get paid for its work. So there was no market that was established that would have given the signal which would have allowed a big battery to be built. It required a government intervention. So this, this whole notion of governance risk, the other thing is that 
AEMO, um, I remember sitting opposite uh, uh, Matt Zima, uh, of blessed memory, who's since died, unfortunately, but he sat opposite us and he told us that he had no uh, concerns at all about the, the level of renewables rising in the system well beyond uh, where we were at that time, 40%. Perhaps even to 60%. He thought it could be managed. Um, he also um, uh, that that after he left, though the the corporate the capacity to actually manage uh, some of the the events and exigencies that we've seen in the market seems to have also dissipated. It's now under new leadership, but there is a real issue of operational capacity in. Um, the, the running of these very complex systems. It was a simple matter in the past to run a national electricity market or any market uh, with thermal generation. It is m far more complicated now. So the skills and capacities of the people that are actually running that system are absolutely crucial. But the good news though, uh, these are all some of the potential risks. The good news is that we had to have, in, in, in a sense, had to re-nationalise elements of our <coughs> market and you already have complete control of your electricity market so that gives you an extraordinary amount of uh, capacity to control. It also gives you the capacity to control any uh, potential exit uh, from coal mining and coal uh, generation. We were just at the mercy of a private operator that decided one day to um, essentially close with very little notice. Uh, you also uh, have a gas reservation policy which provides you with the fuel which would assist you uh, if you were to, to use further gas fire generation. Uh, and you also have a tradition of using the energy policy as a species of economic growth, economic development. Uh, it's not simply been a, essentially a market orientation, there's been, a, there have been other public policy purposes. So. Um, I just want to give you a quick once over lightly about some potential possibilities for, for the Western Australian market. And once, I, once again, I say take this with a pinch of salt. There are some very significant experts that, that I could also direct you to that, that will provide uh, probably much more um, weightier advice. But as I said before, create an integrated system plan. Uh, and the good news is you've already done that. Ensure it incorporates obviously the technical needs of the system, uh, security and reliability of supply, but also it needs to incorporate your ambitions in relation to emissions. Uh, and I know that at a national level, uh, the Federal Labor Party has a, uh, a strong emissions reduction target, uh, which if they form a government in May, uh, should and could be incorporated into the integrated system plan to ensure that it is represented. One of the challenges for Western Australia is it's a relatively carbon intensive state. What that means, if you were to achieve your ambitions or the nations to achieve its ambitions, it means that an above average amount of effort is probably likely to fall on the electricity system. And the good news is that's okay because there are technologies that can assist you there. It's a much harder thing to do to apply it to agriculture, for instance, or to some other sectors of the economy, unless you want to slaughter lots of you know, beasts. But there, you really, it gives you an opportunity to do a lot of the heavy lifting in the electricity sector. If there are to be national targets, and there are now to be born here in Western Australia, um, the electricity sector is likely to bear that burden. The plan should also incorporate, um, as we've said before, generation distribution and, and critically, demand management uh, systems. Um, there have been some examples around the nation of where this has occurred, where um, demand management has been a crucial part uh, of um, supplying the, at low cost, the emissions reductions targets. Of course, it needs to be long term so that people can invest in it. And it also needs to be outcomes based. Um, and in my view, it also should be the subject of a tender process to ask people what actually is available out there. I think that there is an extraordinary amount of talent and innovation that we can unlock if we put in place uh, really clear outcomes about what we seek to achieve. 
Um, and they, they need to be framed in a way which permits people to innovate. What is, really, what is really important is to ensure that we have a system that allows um, people to work across different domains. So the generation needs to work hand in hand with distribution and potentially demand management. One example of that is a retailer bundling up a series of customers with rooftop solar, potentially adding uh, uh, batteries and then offering that as both a demand management and generation opportunity. So one can't think narrowly about the boundaries between distribution, uh, demand management uh, and retail and generation. Those things could all be bound up together. So when, when procuring these, these new opportunities, it's important that the procurement process be as flexible as possible. And this is the one thing that we, I think we achieved with our Renewables Technology Fund. We had a high degree of expertise that we had to bring in from outside of government, because it wasn't available inside government. Uh, and because a lot of the people inside government were former thermal generation guys uh, who thought that that was actually a mistake to move away from this and were pretty sceptical about all this newfangled stuff. And they weren't the sort of people that we wanted running our procurement policy in relation to how we populate this new system with meaning. So making sure that you had a system which, was, which had probity but which also uh, was flexible enough to entertain innovative ideas and you, you know, one, one thing I do know about government is there are some procurement Nazis out there that basically, you know, if it, you want, want to put it into very tight boxes. But you've got to be careful you don't strangle innovation when you do that. It, it's, you, can, you can tick the boxes with probity without strangling innovation. Uh, but it's not simple. And you need a high degree of expertise to be able to analyse these bits to, to sift the, the, the wheat from the chaff. The other thing is I think you need um, a system of governance which separates the market participants, generation, distribution, transmission, from the market operator and indeed the, the rule maker and enforcer uh, and also the market setter, so the people that are actually constructing this new market. Uh, and uh, I think it's, it's a risk if all of those things are done by one group um, one of the things which I think has been a big mistake nationally is the creation uh, of an energy security board uh, which mashes all those things together uh, in a way which is not transparent. Um, one, the statewide blackout, um, it's been three years and we still don't have the report from AER about evaluating AEMO's performance during the statewide blackout. Uh, that's a difficulty. and. You're dealing with very complex systems here. Things can be hidden. Um, there'll always be a tendency for the market operator to want to cover up its mistakes. Uh, there will, and, and a whole lot of things, price, risk. I mean, if you, if you think about it, you're a market operator, the first thing you don't want to have happen is a blackout, because that, that becomes your imperative. That's fine, you can make sure you never have a blackout, but you can also have the highest energy prices in the world when you actually make sure that doesn't happen. So the, there, is an efficiency, there is an efficiency issue here that you'll only discover uh, if you go out to the market and if also you separate out these various elements of the equation. That some competitive tension can be important here, even within, even by still having the government owning uh, the assets and uh, being in charge of these matters. Um, and I suppose that's the final thing. Careful thought needs to be had regard to the quality and status of the individuals who are called upon to deliver these various tools. It is extremely complex. It'll be prone to political pressure. Uh, and ideally the plan uh, will be one where the government establishes it, but then really moves away from it. You don't want to be running on a day-to-day -day basis the electricity system and responding to every bump and crack in the road and it's one of the problems that the national electricity market has got into. Uh, essentially it's privately run one uh, on the national basis 
and through political interventions we've completely sterilised in, in investment in the national electricity market. You have an opportunity here, I think, to get the best of both worlds. You, get the, you can get a lower emissions profile, you can encourage innovation in this market, uh, but you can make it happen because you're in charge, you're the ones doing the procurement. Uh, and, and you can also do it in an efficient way by introducing some degree of um, competitive tension into this system. So I wish you luck. It's a very exciting uh, uh, journey. There are um, one thing for certain, this isn't going away. This is a, a critically important issue. Uh, it, it, it's, an issue, it's a political issue that just simply can't be pushed to the side. I noticed in today's paper there's already a burning platform for the, the Minister. Everybody's saying there's going to be blackouts here because of the way in which uh, renewables are going to push out thermal generation. That's an interesting way of looking at it. Another way of looking at it is that we're taking action on climate change and old thermal power is not uh, fit for purpose in this new world. So it's all a question of how you spin and, and your perspective on these matters. But uh, certainly the, 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 the why has been, has been articulated and uh, now the question is how we populate that and how we make it beneficial for, for all Western Australians. Thank you.